so excited to have a Curtis Sargent with us today. Curtis is focused on multiplying disciples and simple churches all around the world, and he's plugged into a lot of organizations within the multiplication and disciple making disciples space. So Curtis, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Tell us your story. Uh, let, let's start with that. First, your experience, you know, in multiplying disciple making movements abroad, and then later how you've tried to bring that here in the U.S. Um, I grew up um, in Taejon, South Korea through elementary school, and then Taichung, Taiwan for middle school and high school. Came back to the States, went to school, and then went back and, as you mentioned, served in China. The first um, five years is when we started really developing a lot of the approaches that we still use today in um, serving on an island off the south coast um, among an unengaged people group. So and you say you say that word de developing as I was reading some stuff about you I get the sense that as you were going out to do missions you were kind of learning what it means to be a, a, a disciple huh right so a lot of the approaches like the kind of three-thirds approach a lot of people call them dbss and stuff like that um the accountability structures a lot of those things that have been tools we've used since then are things that we developed basically out of desperation because the people group that we were working among it was an unengaged group and you know millions of people and almost zero believers and um the idea of seeing that that big island kind of saturated with churches seemed absolutely impossible using anything that I was familiar with or I had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And so then we just kind of trial and errored a lot. And um, God was gracious and there came a movement that kind of swept across that whole island. And so then we started training other people in other countries to do that. And so and then coaching those. So as a result, I guess I've done live training and coaching in about just shy of 120 countries, but wow. I've trained people who have started churches like this in every country and territory in the world. You know, it's just been something that's been, it was definitely life-changing for me and um, has kind of been a, you know, a major factor in my, my life ever since 90, essentially. Yeah. Do you find that for some people, um, it almost takes a desperation to get them over themselves to, to actually kind of accept the simplicity of this? Yeah, I mean, I think just, you may be familiar with the formula for change that says dissatisfaction with the status quo plus knowledge of a better way plus knowledge of how to take the first steps has to be greater than inertia you know knowledge of the better way and the knowledge of how to take the first steps i think you know those aren't a big problem but the big variable in there is how dissatisfied people are i think that is typical of right <laughs> not just believers but it's typical of everybody of anyone yeah to change, change is, yeah change is hard and we we uh we like our ruts at times right and yeah. and um i've i've shared already in this series that you know um i was very comfortable with the more congregational focused big church oriented that that was my sweet spot and it really took uh, and I, I've heard you talk about this before too, multiple exposures <laughs> to kind of get me over the hump and, and help me, um, help me realize that, uh, boy, God is really in this. You, so you obviously taken it around the world, but you've also been very focused in bringing this to the States and, um, uh one thing i've read and i think one of your bios was um you, you found out many american 
believers have never, ex even though Christianity has been around here for a long time, have never experienced God working in this way. And that when you first started sharing a lot of this, uh, you, you met with a lot of blank stares. How did you get past the blank stares? Yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I have gotten past that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, my focus up until the last half of 2012 for essentially my whole life was um, at least unreached peoples and most of the time unengaged people groups. Um, Cause I, I had that clear call when I was in high school but in the latter part of 2012, um, really clearly felt the Lord telling me I needed to start dedicating half my time to work here in North America. And, you know, I don't think that I've got that figured out yet in terms of how to effectively communicate. But one thing I think I have learned that has been helpful is um, when you're focused on the unengaged world, honestly, the biggest motivator for people working in that world is the, the quantitative aspects, you know, the quantitative advantages. Mm -hmm. But here, there's no doubt that's not a strong felt need. But fortunately, there are also really significant qualitative advantages to this type of disciple making so yeah. the quality of disciples that are made is significantly better and so focusing on those aspects mm -hmm. rather than quantitative aspects i think is you know at least a piece of the answer that i'm yeah, that, that's uh that's something that i think when a lot of people here in the states when we hear people talk about disciple making movements the and multiplication and the power of multiplication versus addition and all that we see just numbers and those numbers can be really exciting to hear about um but often they they walk away only uh, hearing that the, the the quantity of disciples and they're not catching the fact that with with these movements there there is a quality and i i want to i want to dig into that more with you that that's really i think what i want our focus today to be about before we do that though let's finish out your story tell, tell us about uh organizations you're connected with and what you're most excited about right now well that that last one's a little hard um first <laughs> let me mention in case i forget later um, I have written a book that's really addressed at this topic of the qualitative disciples and aimed at a North American audience to try to, to communicate specifically to, to our, you know, tribe here. And it's called The Only One. And you can um, get the ebook for free if you go to theonlyonebook.com. And uh, it'll tell you, give you a code how you can get the ebook for free. Awesome. Um, so, in response to your question, I sort of um, wear a few different hats and fairly evenly to divide my time among those. One is um, just our training center here. We have a little training center, and so we do some live trainings here or I travel other places in the US or around the world doing training live, and that's called MetaCamp. And then the second one would be um, 2414. So it's a coalition of movement practitioners globally that utilize these approaches. And really, they all trace their roots back to common sources in the early, early 90s. Yeah, beautifully ambitious uh, ministry too. Yeah, and um, so currently there are about 80 million believers around the world, mostly in the, heart, the unreached areas is the, where the vast majority are because that's where these movements were started initially. Specifically believers that are connected to these multiplying movements. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's something uh, we, we've had Justin Long uh, and I think probably the stat that just keeps coming back 
to me since that interview was when you're talking 75 to 80 million, you're talking about one in a hundred people in the world being <laughs> connected to a multiplying movement, which gets me really excited because if it's multiplying, that means it might not be long before it's two in a hundred million. <laughs> yeah. And um, they are multiplying because you should look at the growth curve. <laughs> it went from zero in 90 to whatever. Collectively in 2414, the goal is to see these approaches being used in every people group in place globally by the end of 2025. So that's about 100,000 distinct targets. And, you know, right now we're at about 4,000 distinct targets that we're targeting currently. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, movement there. But anyway, I'm one of the two. Very, very strategic movement. Yeah, I'm one of the two global co-facilitators for that. Um, and then one is uh, something called Zume, and it's an introductory online training for multiplying disciples in simple churches that's available, I think, today in 37 languages. You know, we should hit 40 by the end of next month, I think. And um, so people can request a coach and we'll connect them up with a live coach who then hopefully can connect them to more advanced live training and mentoring. Sure. But it's a sort of an on-ramp. And, and that, um, you can find that at zume.training, is that that's right? right. Z-U-M-E dot training. Yeah, and that's something that's been kind of fun since the pandemic started. Right. Um, it wasn't getting that much traffic pre-pandemic at all. It was, a, you know, we there were some, some good things happening, but it was a small thing. Now, throughout most of the pandemic, we've averaged about 50,000 users a month. And um, a lot of those, U.S. is number nine in terms of that. You know, there's places like Algeria and Afghanistan and places <laughs> like that are ahead of the U.S. Ahead of the US. Of wow. Yeah, and then of course some of the usual suspects, you know, like India. But you've seen it. You've seen it grow in the U.S. through the pandemic mm -hmm. year, right? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And um, you know, we we talk about some of the um, you know needing multiple exposures to this and that type of thing. Have you found um, just overall through the COVID year a greater openness to think different about discipleship? Sure, because what we talked about, about the dissatisfaction with the status quo and people see that the current patterns that they had established were not able to function or <clears throat> if they were functioning, they definitely weren't advancing, <laughs> you know, yeah. in, in the they new. Were dis, they were dysfunctioning, maybe. <laughs> in the new realities. So I think that's definitely true. And then the, the fourth would be um serving on the leadership team for finishing the task um that's um something that the version 1.0 which went up till this year and hopefully will conclude by next year sometime um was focused just on getting any kind of church planning work started among unengaged people groups and the version 2.0 is essentially seeking to saturate the globe with these kind of uh you know multiplying churches right uh among, among now, other you know, there's people all over the world at least having some connection or knowledge of someone that's connected with the multiplying movement yeah and so i was kind of involved toward the beginning when it first found it out of table 71 that came out of the amsterdam billy graham thing and at that time, I was serving as vice president for global strategy with the International Mission Board, and they were one of the founding members of that. So I was a representative to, you know, finishing the task when it started and kind of have stuck with them a little bit. So, so Curtis, I, I know you live and breathe this stuff, but I, I think um, I, I try as I do this, I try to put myself in the in the shoes of some people listening who maybe it just you know, Google discipleship, came across discipleship.org, trying to figure out, 
this idea of finishing the task is is a, is kind of a mind blowing thing, but it's very much, um, I think, part of um, obviously Christ's goal when He gave us the Great Commission. If he He didn't give us something He did He didn't believe that that with the through the power of His Spirit we could do right, and so. It's not really been in our paradigm, the idea that he gave us a mission that can be finished, but it's people are starting to realize that 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 is indeed the case, that this is something that can be completed, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's so excited, but it's also very clear that the only way it can be completed is with multiplication otherwise if if we're doing addition growth our growth curve is going to be slower than population growth and so and that's that just gets us back to why what we're talking about is so important for um for everyone i believe to be connected to on on some level because it's it's really um really where you know, God is that, and um, yeah, very exciting. Yeah, and what you said, people don't realize how quickly population is growing. You know, we didn't hit one billion until about 1804, and then you hit two billion around 1950. During my lifetime, essentially, the world population has tripled in my lifetime. Yeah, wow. And I'm I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you don't. I don't even see any gray hairs there. I've got I've got gray going. So yeah, I, was gonna, I am, you know, a number of years older than you, but still, <laughs> I'm still not that old. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, so, keeping up with population growth is not a trivial matter these days. No, no, <laughs> it's, no it's a challenge. Yeah, and also with the shifting of population too. Um, uh, you know, you can't have just, um, well, we're going to, we're going to meet uh, this people group here because a whole bunch of that people group are now going to urban centers around the world and their culture changes when that happens uh, just for the sake of survival. Uh, and so having something that's mobile <laughs> and can move with people uh, is, is really important. I know in our work in Albania, a lot of uh, church leaders continually bemoan the fact that they would they would build up, um, you know, grow their church, but then half of the people would leave because so many in Albania are trying just for just for economic reasons are trying to get out of Albania to find jobs and that kind of thing, and and I was trying to tell them, hey celebrate that you've got a built-in mobilization platform to train people up and don't don't feel like you know when they leave they have to leave with their tail tucked between their legs saying oh i'm sorry but send them out on mission you know but that that mobile aspect of population is really growing around the world as well absolutely yeah that's which, a whole, whole series in and of itself <laughs> yeah which presents amazing opportunities for us here in the states because we have unreached peoples coming to us i'm sure you've been involved in a lot of that as well huh? something else that i read in your your bio that i want to hone in on and and i'm just going to read what it said because i really liked it said most of us cannot merely hear the principles then put them into practice we need to see feel taste touch and experience before we can implement uh explain that because it's it's very different from the typical form of education that we have in the west the kind of the bell curve that we're all familiar with you've got your first two standard deviations you know like usually over on the left that are the innovators and the early adopters and um so those those people which is not a large percentage of the population less than 10 percent those people may be able to, you know, learn without those other things. But everybody else on that <laughs> that continuum, 
um, they need those things. And that, that just makes sense from an educational perspective. From an education, I have one of my graduate degrees is actually in education. And um, kind of three of the keys to people really learning something include, of course, repetition. Um, secondly, applying what they learn. And thirdly, teaching others. And um, those aspects um, are rarely included in our kind of church culture in this country, at least in the last couple of generations, I would say. Um, and yeah, so those are things that are built in from day one in discipling a person in these movement approaches is they are applying what they've learned and they're passing it on to others. And there's accountability for doing that. And that builds in the repetition. And so, yeah, I think what you said is absolutely true. Most people will not learn it. Another thing that we often neglect is, and I think this includes the innovators and early adopters, that we don't ever really learn something unless our whole being is engaged with it. Yeah. And so it's not just our intellect. It's also our emotions. It's also, you know, it's all of the aspects yeah. of our personality. And so if we're in some kind of an artificial, you know, environment that is not engaging us on all of those levels, then we're not going to really learn it. And that's really difficult to do in some of our sort of traditional um, formal education yeah. methodology. What we've, what we've traditionally called discipleship classes or things like that. Uh, and not just in the church, but yeah. in our education system yeah. as a whole, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's true of the church, but it's also true of our general educational system. Right, right. We're, we're a product of all of that. Um, one of the things that this made me think of, obviously, when you're focused on not just learning, but applying and applying it even on the level where you can teach it, you know, every, all of us know that if you end up being asked to teach something, you're going to learn more about that than probably any other task you do. But that applying it, uh, you know, putting it into practice, um, that's something that I, uh, in a, a previous um, episode of this series with Roy Moran, we, we focused in on that idea of obedience um, versus just knowledge, putting it into practice, that kind of thing. But th the other aspect of this that it made me think of is in order to see, feel, taste, touch, experience, uh, disciple making, that happens within relationships. And, and so I'd, I'd really like us to kind of focus in on this idea of, of um, community and relationship and how that adds to the quality of, of disciple making that you're talking about. You know, in, in, the, in the blog article I wrote um, introducing this series, one of the barriers in our culture and we're not the only culture with these kind of barriers, but one of them that I, uh, I recognize is that we don't really do community and relationship very well. I think COVID has um, compounded that probably, but uh, share, share some of your thoughts on that idea of, of relationship with regards to the kind of disciple making you're talking about and that, that you're training. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a big topic. Yeah. Um, part of it, I think, kind of goes back to even just our overall worldview. And we do have here, um, you know, quite an individualistic bent to our worldview. And that, that's, you know, while scripture has shaped parts of our culture, um, that's not something that we picked up from scripture. You know, like if you think about, the, you know, the covenants in the Bible between God and people, there are corporate covenants. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you could 
make a, a case for the Abrahamic covenant being with an individual, but from day one, God made it super clear that this was one that was intended to expand. Yeah, it was about generations, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and then we we just tend to spend a little, give a little more attention and a little more focus to the individualistic aspects. One of the identifiers of us as a, the people of God is our love for one another. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, John 13, 34 and 35 basically says that's the defining characteristic of our spiritual family as the family of God. Mm -hmm. And that kind of love is expressed personally, not institutionally, you know, so we we've developed systems to take care of, of these needs, right? Or professionalized. The institutionalized it. systems. So, you know, if, if we have orphans, we've developed orphanages rather than equipping every disciple to be ready to take in orphans. Yeah. It's a very different thing. And we've professionalized it. And so, um, reclaiming you know this basic identifier is critical i mean how we cannot be communicating to others who god is if we don't have this basic right. identifier you're talking you know talk about orphanage and professionalizing that we've kind of done that with uh discipleship or disciple making we've professionalized it so that being a disciple maker, that's for the paid religious professionals, maybe not for the everyday person. Right. Um, and I'm, maybe I'm using discipling in a broader context. Sure. Me, it's everything, it's teaching them to obey everything he commanded. You know, so that's, that's a super broad, super broad <laughs> thing. Right. It encompasses all of life and how we do all of life. Um, how we look at spiritual gifts. It's really ironic because God tells us that, or, you know, Paul tells us right. is the three, the three biggest of the four passages that talk about spiritual gifts were in Pauline epistles. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the designs is to cause us to cement our bonds and create a culture of interdependence in the church. And somehow here we have completely twisted that and it becomes about how I can express my individuality, how right. I can achieve, you know, my greatest fulfillment when that's right i'm, I'm going to take my i'm going to take my spiritual <laughs> gifts test so i can know what i can be about in my spiritual rock and whereas the scriptures they put that focus on how these spiritual gifts weave together to, yeah. you know, to form and the body so, yeah so it's like we've taken the opposite you know emphasis on it and so there are just a lot of issues around that and even you know, um, if you think about just some of the basic expressions of our faith, the one that I think there is some appreciation for here would be around worship, although that's a little bit narrowly defined here, but at least there's an appreciation of right. corporate aspects of that. But some of the other basic tools that we use to grow or God uses to grow us are intended to have a significant corporate expression. So, for example, um, the word, right? How we have somehow shifted that is we have become accustomed to it be being a one-to-many expression, and it's not personalized for us it's you know it's so on and it's this one way rather than a mutual joint 
you know, interpretation and application and, with and real mutually, personal. Mutually discovering as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know when I, um, when I started uh, leading uh, discovery Bible studies, I had so much untraining to do because I, I was, uh, I had learned and, and it was comfortable with that kind of top down. Okay. I have this knowledge about the scripture. I need to impart to you. When I finally learned to shut my mouth and, and trust the Holy spirit and um, allow everyone together to discover together, it, it blew me away. The lessons I learned from, uh, um, from passages that it, it what they weren't pulling it out of, you know, uh, space, it was very much relevant from the passage. People, the, the spirit was working through others and the group every time I've done it in ways that if it had just been top down from me, even though I like to think I'm a good teacher, it would have never happened. It was so much more relevant through relationship. Yeah, um, absolutely. And um, the thing is, not to burst your bubble, but you probably weren't a good teacher if you measure that in terms of the people that you're teaching, yeah. not only hearing it, understanding it, but doing it and passing it on, mm -hmm. you probably weren't a very good Oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> you I know, absolutely you know, know that I was a lousy uh, leader for a long time because it took me so long to understand it's not about me and it's not about my knowledge. It's about God's word and, and through his spirit, what he wants to uh, help us in community to discover together. Yeah. And so, I mean, it wasn't just you. It's just that's not how people learn. Yeah. What we were talking about earlier about they need to experience it. They need to live yeah. it. They need to be teaching it. They need to all of those things. If they're not doing that, they're not going to learn it. I don't care how good you are. You know, I don't care how many brilliant and amazing insights you have and how you communicate them in a way that can be remembered and all the ones that even that touch the heart, that if those other aspects aren't in place, people aren't going to learn it. And it's only possible with this corporate mutuality, this interdependence that we're and, designed to have. And I just, I invite everyone listening just to just take a moment and think back to the most powerful lessons God has taught you in your spiritual walk. Were they sitting in a pew listening to someone preach or were they an actual experience with God and with his people? <laughs> yeah. Um, and prayer is similar, though we'll, we'll have prayer meetings where we will be praying together and that's good and that's positive. But often they're not, it's not, um, building on one another it, it's it's somewhat parallel to the spiritual gifts um, example that i gave mm -hmm. god very rarely reveals all of his purposes and will and ways and all of that to an individual on behalf of you know the larger body right the way he works is as in the spiritual gifts. He will give each of us a portion of that insight and truth and understanding and all of that of his will, purposes, ways, character, you know, desires. And unless we are intentionally sharing those insights with one another and then figuring out yeah. direction not only for us individually but corporately mm -hmm. so in, in movements well anyway i'll finish that thought unless we're doing that there is no way we will come to as full an understanding as we would if we were praying together with that intention sure and that, that, those, that that prayer combined with um the, the mutually discovering um his word together, I think, points us to um, a purposefulness, I guess, 
of, of the community that it's not just about relationships. It's about us having a common purpose, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that's tied to another whole issue of how in our culture, we've come to think of prayer so much as us speaking to God, which is only half of prayer <laughs> or hopefully even less than half. But the other half is him speaking to it us. It really does need to be less than half. <laughs> and so being intentional, not only about individually spending time focused just on listening corporately to do that is is extremely important and it's difficult um but it's it is important and one of the the things that uh, uh, i know makes makes it difficult within our culture is that we we keep ourselves so busy we don't have margin for relationship i'm sure in the movements you've seen um, they place such a high priority on, on an investment of time with, um, with their, the community of faith and with the purposes that that community goes out with. Yeah. Um, in the book that I mentioned, that's kind of what the first chapter or second, I don't remember, first or second chapter is primarily about and sort of looking at that in some detail. Um, the Trinity is really our model for unity. So, you know, whether it's in John 17 or, you know, there's, there's evidence for this throughout scripture. That is the type of unity we are called to be in, not only with God, but with one another. And if what, um, if what Christ clearly prayed for in John yeah. 17 with a purpose right that so that the world will oh, know no. it's it is that it, yeah it is that community that where the power uh i think that 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 fuels this movement is is about is that community that happens that is like christ and and uh and his father and the spirit yeah and in some places here in north america even where movements are starting um it seems to be a whole another level of challenge for them to understand that the applications to to obey and share what the lord is showing us aren't just for us as individuals but include corporate obedience right and corporate passing on and um yeah so and for that to happen there is a level, and this kind of gets us to the other part I wanted to focus on. There's a level of transparency, transparency and accountability that we, uh, in our in individualistic tendencies, shy away from in our culture, right? That uh, there's, a, there's a level of transparency and accountability that I think is crucial for us to kind of come come to each other with open hands and this is me the good the bad and the ugly and we're going to work through these things together in obedience right right so for example um this relates to god's patterns of communication and we have especially technology has really impacted our views on communication and i have a chapter on that in the book as well but to really shortcut the, that discussion, essentially, God's communications are personal and impactful and authoritative in what, what we commonly think of as evangelism, right? Communicating to those who are not yet in our spiritual family. I think we need to accommodate some of those cultural changes that have taken place in order that people can and will hear the message but once someone enters the kingdom there is no doubt that it's not an accommodation from that point on it's a remediation we are drawing people back to an understanding of god's design and intentions and ways of communicating 
And um, that's a process. That's, yeah, not a snap. A, that's just not a snap of the finger and it's a messy process, right? Yeah. But it does tie to all of these things we've been talking about because the fact that it's personal, what we're used to in the church is the pastor um, communicates a generic application or maybe even two or three generic applications that he hopes will apply to some people right. as opposed to having these small groups that are learning and discovering together God's truths and then listening to him for specific personal identifications that we then share with one another so there can be accountability for applying that what he's showing us and passing it on to others growing up every now and then i i, I could i could point and say wow the the preacher really stepped on my toes in other words he he, he was hitting me where i'm at but that was just an every now but god god has a way of stepping on our toes every every time we meet with them, right? And so if we provide that space within yeah. community um, to allow the spirit to work in that way, it's it's going to be relevant all the time. Yeah, and that happens, you know, because we are being interactive, we are being responsive. It's not a matter of content delivery. It's not a matter of just being exposed to truth, yeah. but it's, you know, we're being, scrubbed <laughs> you know, there, there's there's um friction you right, know happening right. there and so that responsiveness that interactivity are maybe, maybe not only maybe not only scrubbed but uh peeled like an onion right uh, yeah yeah so that's essential if we're going to i mean that's tied directly to that transparency that you're talking about we can't, you know, maintain some kind of a false front and receive that kind of benefit. <laughs> it requires how, transparency. How do you, when, when you're in a, a culture that values privacy on the level we do, and even within our churches, a lot of times um, you, um, you seldom see a transparency model from leadership or whatever. How, how do you try to get people in this culture um, to a point where they're willing to be um, transparent, willing to be held accountable? Yeah, modeling it, like you said, like we said, you've mentioned twice, I think, already this idea of seeing it, tasting it, feeling it, all of that. So modeling it is the strongest way to do that. And while we you know, are a little bit extreme in our culture on appreciating privacy. In some, a lot of other cultures, there's an even greater barrier, which is the whole honor shame. Honor shame, yeah. Kind of you don't want to bring shame cultural, to yourself or family. Yeah, cultural tendency. And we don't have so much of that here. That's very strong in many cultures. And in some ways, even more of a challenge to this kind of transparency. Yeah. Than, than the privacy challenge. So this isn't a, a unique, to, you know, a problem that's unique to us as a Absolutely. whole. Absolutely, and, and every time I've experienced movements, I've seen that uh, kind of gut-wrenching transparency model from, from, uh, from every leader. I mean, they, they just live life out in the open and, and uh, they're amazingly honest about um, their failings, uh, and I know with within the disi this discipleship journey, the disciples journey, you celebrate the process of moving closer to Christ. You know, uh, and and um, and so that when you share that, well, last week when we met, I really felt convicted. God wanted me to do this, and I didn't really do it but I did part of it. And so, okay, we'll celebrate that part that you've done and, and grow together. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, having that model from the leadership, um, no matter what culture you're in, I think 
has to happen. Yeah. Um, another factor, and this one varies because there are many movements around the world that don't necessarily use this pattern, but I think I can tell a qualitative difference between those that don't and do, and that is having a weekly accountability time with another believer where you really dig in depth to a lot, a whole bunch of key issues. Mm-hmm. And so these groups, they do large quantities of scripture reading together and um, discuss that, but then also just do sort of a quick spiritual checkup with one another wow. every week that really digs in deep. And in my mind, that serves as a sort of an early warning system so that no patterns of sin can, you know, they're, they're identified and dealt with very quickly, very early. So between that and the large consumption of scripture, I think I can tell a qualitative difference over time between the disciples and movements that use that type of additional accountability weekly and those that don't. And, and uh, it's not a, um, it's not a rigid legalistic kind of check the boxes deal. It's, it's very grace filled. Um, but it keeps everyone real with each other. It just, it, it, it disallows people to have any kind of mask that they can put on when they're with the Christian people and then go do whatever else they want to do <laughs> the rest of the time. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I think that, um, you know, one of the critiques of people that really don't know about disciple making movements, but, uh, that I hear every now and then is a concern that as you go from the leader down into uh, multiple generations, there's a, there's a possibility of kind of going into heresy or whatever, but that gets, that really gets back to understanding the quality level of, of disciple making, because honestly, I, I see, um, I see church members that are part of congregational churches much more likely of kind of moving out of faith or into um, in a, a heretical faith than I do within disciple making movements because there is that continual focus back on the word, learning from the word together, mixed with uh, a very real and relevant accountability um, as people grow together. Has that been your experience? Yes. um, Again, I could talk at least an hour just on that, responding to that one question. Um, And I will mention there is a chapter in that book that I mentioned that talks about that very directly. Yeah, one of the interesting things I point out in that chapter is having a look at the website, thestateoftheology.com, which is um, an annual, very large scale. Um, investigation of theological beliefs of Americans. I imagine it's pretty eye-opening, huh? Yeah, and even among those who identify as evangelicals and meet um, very strict criteria as to how you define an evangelical, it's not just self-identification, but they have to strongly agree with four specific tenets. Even among those people, there are huge, major, overwhelming majority types of heresies that are very common among those people in our country. And so the first thing I want to note when I start those discussions is what we've been doing definitely isn't working. Right. (laughs) So if you're just scared that something like that could happen (laughs) in another way, First of all, we need an attitude check before we have that discussion, and, <laughs> and then we have that discussion. But um, yeah, and a I lot of times those agree. kind of things or concerns happen from you know church leaders uh, who are obviously concerned for the flock in a good way, but um, we're so used to us having control of what they learn that it's it's a huge paradigm shift for us to say okay i'm going to trust god's word i'm going to trust his spirit 
to work in my people. And if we have something that is continually bringing a community of faith back to him in this way, I'm just going to have to be more trusting, right? <laughs> yeah. So this goes back to the discussion we had earlier when I said, you know, if we measure it with them actually applying and passing on those things that you, you weren't a good teacher because nobody is. And so those people, you know, if they are leaders or whatever, they're making this assumption that if I know the truth and I speak the truth, people, first of all, they hear it, they understand it, they believe it, they do it, they practice it. Well, I guarantee that at least the, the believe it, do it, practice it parts, we can definitely show that th those patterns aren't working here. So, you know, there's just this kind of, well, and it, it also ties back to the, the transparency thing. Mm -hmm. It's not all the, the fault of people that we have these one way, yeah. um, you know, these it's one what, way interaction modeled because that, that is what's been modeled. And that the assumption that their people believe what's true because that's what they've said is because the people are never allowed to speak. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you've got <laughs> one to a hundred or one to 200, you're not going to be in their lives enough to really know if they're living it yes. out as well. Exactly. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. So, and that goes back to, um, I think the, the, the community and relationship, having something, I know a lot of, of um, the audience of this will be people involved in congregational churches. How can we develop a disciple making culture? And a lot of times you realize, okay, we're really weak on relationship if all we have is a large Sunday gathering. So you, you develop small groups, but that becomes um, more just about um, fellowship, and it's, it doesn't have that purposeful aspect. It probably doesn't have the transparency aspect. But when you put the, the, the purposefulness into it, put the mission into it of, of disciple making and, and uh, growing as disciple, put um, that accountability, then it can, it, can bring, it can bring those small groups alive as long as there are is there someone modeling it with, within that, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, it is challenging, though, because you, you kind of get into these ruts, and there's, there has to be sometimes some things that, that shake it up. I think COVID has been a good shaker for, for, for our culture, and that's why there's more interest in this now. The website that has your, your book, The Only One Living Fully In by and for God. And um, so it's, uh, it's available. The only one book.com will be sure to put the links to the, the other resources that you mentioned in the chat area of the discipleship.org collective as well. But Curtis, thanks so much for uh, spending this time with us. Appreciate it. You're welcome.